people are nuts, it. man. You ready to go? Yeah. All right, this is uh, December of 1991. My dear friends, it's winter holiday season, and I've got the urge to write and wish you peace and love and joy. With no motive beyond that, here goes, and well, it's about time. When I left home at age 17, I was confident of some basic things. I was white American male, also white was good, American was good, male was good, sex was good, money was good, death was bad, time was sure. Seven months later, after living what life presented with enthusiasm, with ears and eyes wide in the military and college, nothing was sure. Once I accepted total uncertainty, the concept exploded my mind like lightning inside a great cloud. The truth that I didn't know the truth illuminated the cloud of unknowing, of unknowing that is consciousness from the inside and then dissipated in an amorphous space. My mind was blown. Reality was nebulous. I didn't know what was true. I didn't know what was of value. I didn't know how to judge value. I didn't know what time it was or what time was. My reality was a shambles and nothing happened. I breathed, I ate and slept and had urges. I still had to pay debts and get along. All was the same except yet different and I wanted to talk about this amazing awareness of uncertainty but I found not being sure of anything a very difficult topic to broach. For example, in the early 1980s, about 10 years into living with uncertainty, married with children, and trying to settle into life on Liberty Street in Southeast Fresno, I invited people for a small party with a handcrafted invitation to join us, Tina and Eric, for an evening of time with refreshments, entertainments, and delights. At the bottom was written, admission. You must read or talk about time. Only a couple of people showed up and they came without the price of admission. I took that as confirming that time is not a subject most people I know care about and not a personal snub. And I didn't give it more thought until I chanced to read The Discoverers, a history of man's search to know his world and himself. And it made me think of time and the party because an entire section of the book is the development of the concept of time. How timeless, I think, and I mean to write to you about it. For most of history, an hour was different for different peoples, locations, and ages. For example, in Christendom during the Middle Ages, hours were times for prayer, such as maintenance, dawn to sunrise, or a prima sunrise to mid-morning. These hours were determined by the sun, and so, depending on season and latitude, the first hour might be longer or shorter than the second. About 1330 AD, the escapement, a device that allows a force to be broken into even units, tick tock, came into common use. These tick tocks were calibrated into 24 hours, noon to noon, regardless of where or when the sun rises. And the author claims, there are few greater revolutions in human experience than the movement from the seasonal hour to the equal hour. Few greater revolutions, the 60 minute hour, revolutionary for me, but judging from the turnout at my timeless soiree and from the many conversations I've never had, most people don't give any time to time. Still, the author is not simply some bozo from the south side of Fresno, so his opinion is noteworthy. To add weight to his claim, I'll copy some, but not all, of the credentials in the bio on the dust jacket of his book. Borson got his BA from Harvard and PhD from Yale. He's a lawyer before the Massachusetts Bar and a Rhodes Scholar. He was admitted to barrister at law at the Inner Temple, London. He has been visiting professor of American history at the University of Rome, Puerto Rico, Geneva, Geneva and Kyoto, as well as at Cambridge and at the Sorbonne. He taught at Harvard and Swarthmore, and for 25 years, he was Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. He is the Director of the National Museum of History and Technology, also Senior Historian of the Smithsonian, and since 1975, the Librarian of Congress. If his contention about the revolutionary escapement now intrigues you, look up his book as he can define his conclusions ably, and as for me, when I read him, I knew the time was right and I began composing this letter, wanting to share authors and ideas about time. 
For instance, The Abyss of Time by Claude Alberton chronicles the changing conceptions of Earth antiquity since the 16th century. Only a few hundred years ago, Western civilization believed Earth was a few thousand years old, while today the scientific thinking world community holds with an age of uh, billions of years. A person's lifetime has changed from 1% of all time to an insignificant blip in infinity. There's a book, An Odyssey of Time by Dale Russell, uh, subtitled Dinosaurs of North America, and he uses fossil remains to, of extinct creatures to support the idea of the immensity of time. In clear, brilliant illustrations and prose, the author reconstructs the environment where the bones were laid down and then places that environment in time. Was the dinosaur adapted to highland forest, lowland swamp, arid desert? Did she swim in lakes or bays or open ocean? The skeleton of a huge sea creature dug out of the earth 6,000 feet above sea level in Wyoming with few, a few other thousand feet of earth deposited yet above makes a compelling argument for the long years of life on earth. This book is large size, but I'm sure the library can secure a copy for you to read. And while you're at the library, ask for Corridors of Time, 1,700,000,000 years of Earth at the Grand Canyon by Ron Redford. There, the author uses the layers of rocks exposed, one above the other, to illustrate the time in much the same manner as Russell did with fossils in the dinosaur book. I do not recommend this book to you because of the author's dust jacket bio, uh, a photographer from England now living in Colorado, but because the book is wonderfully written and marvelously illustrated. His main point is very crudely summarized in the drawing I'll show you now. Beginning with the rim rock of Bryce Canyon, A in the drawing, and let me see, let me show you the drawing here. This is the okay. Good. Uh, in A in the drawing, <laughs> and uh, beginning with the rim rock of Bryce Canyon, that would be A in the drawing that I showed you the schematic, and continuing downward through Zion and then through the pit of the Grand Canyon, thousands of feet of sedimentary rock are exposed and by calculating the time for an inch of silt to accumulate and then multiplying that by the inches from the rim of Bryce to the depth of the Grand Canyon, an immense age is obvious and yet that's only a half-life because the earth here has been squeezed skyward thousands of feet above the sea as it is today only to be eroded as the Colorado River is doing today and become a catchment for the kind of sediment we see exposed today. The gaps pictured at B, D, F and H were mountains that rose, towered and were eroded from the record. The rock missing from those Sierras washed away into the lowlands to the north to cover the bones of the dinosaurs recounted in the other book, uh, Redfern says that counting the present inches and allowing for the missing mountains one arrives at 1,700,000,000 years. And that's a long time. And that's a long time. And then check out, um, you can sort of see where this mountain range disappeared and uh, what was there flowed to the north and covered the dead dinosaur, which we find in the other book. I recommend both books to you. I think you, thinking of time makes me think of number 32 in the 101 Zen stories by Paul Reps in Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. A Lord asked Takuan, a Zen teacher, to suggest how he might pass the time. He felt his days very long attending the office and sitting stiffly to receive the homage of others. And Takuan wrote eight Chinese characters and gave them to the man. Not twice this day, inch, time, foot, gym. I didn't appreciate this story much. Not twice this day, inch, time, foot, gym. So blunt, so ungainly and obvious. Until I was copying that schematic for you because the inch from E to G is a mighty mountain range that rose
that rose and was destroyed. Wow, yeah. I don't think I would have copied the Zen story here except that I recently read something called 19 Ways of Looking at Wang Wei by Elliot Weinberger and Octavio Paz, and that adds a new dimension to it. They discuss Chinese language and writing and problems and possibilities in translating Chinese poetry, and they illustrate the discussion with 19 visions, excuse me, 19 versions of a poem by the Tang Dynasty author Wang Wei. They explain that any Chinese ideogram may have many meanings as it may be a noun, a verb, an adjective, singular, plural, past, present, future. This gives such meat to not twice this day, inch, time, foot, gym, that it prowled around in my head and out into this letter and it dragged Wang Wai along with him too. And these are the Chinese ideograms that he included. Uh, the poem is selected its particular time of day, late afternoon in a mountain woodland. Wang Wei tries to capture time and put it on paper by the color given to moss by sunlight in the deep woods. The first of the 19 is the 20 ideograms crudely depicted above. The second is the phonetic English. And the third is the possible meanings of each character that have been intercalated with the ideograms. There follow 16 translations in various European languages done over the last 300 years. Here's my translation. Empty mountains, nobody in sight, yet people talking, echoes sound, sun rays reach deep through the forest, reflected, shining greenly on the moss. Good. Uh, but all spinning bodies slowed their roll, and I've read that a billion years ago, Earth made a complete rotation in 23 of our current hours. It's a bit hard to imagine, but it gets even more bizarre. Unless you had some way to stand back and observe, you wouldn't even notice because all the clocks would be calibrated to mark 24 hours, noon to noon. So time is light, time is relative. In fact, the modern view of science is that time is relative. That is to say, time is different at the same time, depending on your point of view. Picture this, you look out the window of your spaceship, as you lift off from Earth and you see that the launch clock says it's 12.15. You fly away at the speed of light and you take uh, care of your flight duties for an hour and you glance up at the stern window and you see that the launch clock says 12.15, although your onboard clock says 1.15. The launch clock didn't stop, but the light rays reflected from the clock face are coming towards your eye at the same speed you were flying away. At the launch center, Time marches on, and in your craft, time marches on. But there has been no time since your departure. Current science holds that not only is time relative, but also that time, matter, energy, and gravity are interrelated. Since Hiroshima, I know that energy is the same thing as matter multiplied by the square of the speed of light. Incredible number. But that gravity affects light is something I don't fathom and believe only because it was proposed by Einstein and believe only because it was proposed by Einstein and confirmed by scientific experiment. Still, I can relate gravity and time another way. I saw a picture in an architectural digest magazine of a 14th century Italian home with original windows still in place. The glass was very thin and clear at the top but thick and wavy at the bottom and the caption noted that gravity is a constant force and glass is actually a very viscous liquid that is slowly being pulled into a puddle. Time is not only relative with regard to energy, gravity and matter, but culturally as well. Pre-Columbian Maya thought of time as linear, beginning millions and millions of years ago. Hindus also think of time in millions and millions of years, but not as linear, rather as a great re recurring cycles. Devout Jews say that time began 5,751 years ago. Fundamental Christians say time has a recent beginning and a near end. Devout Muslims think that time before the prophet appeared is unimportant and date everything from an event in his life uh, 1,412 years ago. The idea of dating reference to something else like Muhammad's hijra or Christ's birth used to be very common but very relative because each king in each kingdom would start a new calendar with his accession to power.
I mentioned earlier that Wang Wai was a Tang Dynasty poet, but until I add here that he wrote around 770 in the Christian era, you would not, uh, you would have a slight chance of knowing when he wrote. Thinking of time beginning and ending with the passing of a king makes me think of this poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley from the Hanover Dynasty, or that would be 1800, the Christian era. And the poem is called Osmandias. I love this poem. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered vision lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on those lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pat pedestal, these words appear. My name is Osmandius, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch away. Of course, this sentiment was noted much earlier by that master of timely observation, Ecclesiastes. The men of old are not remembered, and those who follow them will not be remembered by those who follow them. That's chapter 1, verse 11. Now that Ecclesiastes has made his way into this letter, I think it's timely to add uh, chapter 11, verse 7. The light of day is sweet, and pleasant to the eye is the sight of the sun. If a man lives for many years, he should rejoice in all of them. Rejoice? You bet. My wish is for peace and joy and love. If there are billions and billions of years under our feet and billions and billions of sunlit years to come, and if time is twisting and bending and creeping off at right angles, relatively speaking, and if the time of our life begins only with birth and ends with death, and if judgment time is soon and if you and I have no idea of time or too many ideas of time, then there's no time like now to rejoice. Inch of time, foot of gym, remember? Timeless, with peace and love, Eric. Well, I copied this letter into the computer August of 2016, and I want to add that since the original uh, writing, I have read John McPhee's book, Basin and Range, that is about the geologic history of the rocks along Interstate 80 between Colorado and California. It is erudite yet easy reading and a wonderful complement to the books about dinosaur bones and the layers and gaps of stone in the Grand Canyon because it describes how the west coast of North America tectonic plates broke off and drifted away and then exposed edges of the continent was rammed by an incoming tectonic plate crumpling the edges of the smashing plates to form a great mountain range so many millions of years ago that it washed down to almost nothing when wham another plate slammed in Another range rose and fell to low-level plain, only to be whacked a third time and yet again a fourth colossal collision that is currently pushing the Sierra Nevada of California skyward and crumpling and forcing up all the land between there and the Rockies, called after the topography of the basin and range.